Taxes are special fees charged by a government on the people who live in a country, state, or city. These fees help pay for public services like police, road, and bridge repair, and public schools. In the United States, people have to pay national, state, and local taxes. Income tax is a tax applied to how much money a person earns in a year. There are both federal and state income taxes. These have to be paid every year by April 15th. There are special forms the Internal Revenue Service, IRS, the government agency in charge of collecting taxes, asks people to fill out. There are tax credits that people with low income, college students, and parents can get. These credits could mean actually getting money back from the government. This money is called a tax refund. People can get both a federal and state tax refund. Anyone who works has to be taxed regardless of the immigration status. Not paying income taxes could mean a fine or even jail time. Payroll taxes are taxes that are taken right out of a person's paycheck. There are federal and state payroll taxes. These include Social Security and Medicare taxes. Social Security taxes pay for the retirement and disability benefits received by millions of Americans each year. Medicare taxes pay for the federal health insurance program that covers the elderly and the disabled. People who own houses pay property taxes. The amount paid depends on how much the property is worth. This tax is usually paid once a year. Sales tax is a tax almost everyone pays. Sales tax is a specific extra percentage charged on nearly all purchases. Everything from soap to furniture has a sales tax attached when bought. The amount of the sales tax is different across states and cities. Health insurance is one way to pay for health care. Health care includes visits to the doctor, prescription medication, and emergency services. People can pay for medicine and doctor visits directly in cash, or they can use health insurance. Health insurance usually means you pay less for these services. There are different types of health insurance. At some jobs, companies offer health insurance plans as part of a benefits package. Individuals can also buy health insurance. The elderly and disabled can get government-run health insurance through programs like Medicaid and Medicare. There are many different health insurance companies or plans. Each health plan has a set of doctors they work with. Once a person picks a plan, they pay a premium, which is a fixed amount of money every month. Once in a plan, a person picks a doctor they want to see from that plan. That doctor is the person's primary care provider. Obamacare, or the Affordable Care Act, is a recently passed law that makes it easier for people to get health insurance. The law requires all Americans have health insurance by 2014. Those that do not get health insurance by the end of the year will have to pay a fine in the form of extra tax when they file for their income taxes. Through Obamacare, people can still get insurance through their jobs, privately or through Medicaid and Medicare. They can also buy health insurance through state marketplaces where people can get help choosing a plan based on their income and health care needs. These marketplaces also create an easy way to compare what different plans offer. If people cannot afford to pay health insurance, they may qualify for government programs that offer free health insurance like Medicaid, Medicare, or for children. A special program called the Children's Health Insurance Program, CHIP. Immigration in the United States is a complicated and controversial issue. Since the founding of the country, people have come from different countries in search of a better life and opportunities. Immigration laws, however, are always changing and are complicated. This leads to many people coming into the U.S. without proper legal status. While some people call immigrants who come and stay in the U.S. without proper papers illegals, many consider this term offensive. The more acceptable term is undocumented, since they do not have the correct legal documents. It is estimated that there are more than 11 million undocumented people in the United States. While some people will say there is no reason for immigrants to be undocumented in the U.S., there are limits on the amount of green cards, or legal permanent resident cards people from certain countries can get. There are also long waiting lists, up to 14 years in some cases, for people coming from certain countries to apply for legal status in the U.S. Additionally, there are a limited number amount of visas or permits for people coming into the U.S. with manual labor skills. Millions of undocumented people have been deported or sent back to their country of origin under President Obama. 
In 2013, the U.S. Senate passed an immigration reform bill. The law adds extra border security along the U.S.-Mexico border and also makes it easier for immigrants to become citizens. The bill, which also has to be approved by the House of Representatives, has not yet been presented or voted on by Congress. Because of this, many are asking President Obama to take action to protect some of the undocumented, many of whom have been in the U.S. for many years and have children that are U.S. citizens. The American Community College system is a place for second chances. Community college are two-year schools that thrived in California after the end of World War II. Many American military personnel were returning to civilian life after their service to their country. Some of these young people decided not to go to college after high school so that they could serve their country during that time of need. When they returned, many of them turned to the community college system in California to continue their education. The United States government introduced the GI Bill at the time giving returning servicemen and women educational benefits to help them get back to school. Soon, community colleges and new school districts began appearing throughout the country. Community colleges helped ease returning military personnel back into college life. It was a low-cost, less stressful alternative to going back to a four-year university. Today, community colleges attract students from all parts of the world. In California, a large population of students comes from Asia and Latin America. These schools provide a second chance to international students who may have experienced difficulties attending college in their native countries. American students who may have not done well academically in high school and did not enter a university can turn to community college for a second chance too. Community colleges provide a much needed resource for all these students. Foreign military personnel, international students, and high school students alike are all welcome. One of the best things about community colleges is that they accept anyone at any time. This means people who have not found what they want to do in life can try more than one area of study. If they don't like one course of study, they can always try something else. That is the beauty of community colleges. These days, many people attend community colleges with plans to transfer to a four-year college or university to get a bachelor's degree. It's kind of a, like a stepping stone. There are many reasons why people do this. One reason is that some community colleges have transfer agreements with private and state colleges and university that guarantee admission. Even if a community college doesn't have the agreement of a guaranteed spot in a four-year college, it has articulation agreements with four-year schools. These agreements tell you exactly what classes a student in a community college needs to take in order to be able to transfer. These agreements make sure that students don't waste time taking classes that won't transfer. Most of these classes one needs to take before transferring are general education classes like math and English. Another reason why many students start their undergraduate degree at a community college is a financial one. A four-year college or university is much more expensive than a two-year college. This is especially true for immigrant students who don't qualify for financial aid, loans, or scholarships. Also, community colleges tend to offer more evening classes so they can accommodate people who have to work while attending school. They are also a good option for older students with families who need a more flexible schedule while taking care of children. Community colleges also tend to be commuter schools, meaning people don't have to live on a campus in dorms. Attending a community college means you can still live at home with your parents, which can save the family a huge amount of money. If a student didn't do well in high school, a community college would provide him or her with another opportunity to enter a four-year university. Community colleges offer many classes to help students develop their math and writing skills. When you attend a four-year college, you are expected to have those skills already. Community college will prepare students to successfully graduate from a four-year school. Most children in the U.S. begin school at age five. When they go to kindergarten, this is the beginning of elementary or primary school. Most children stay in elementary schools till they are about 11 years old. Elementary schools are divided by grades. The youngest children begin in kindergarten at age 5, and then go to first grade, second grade, and so on. Most elementary schools go up to fifth or sixth grade. The focus of an elementary school is basic academic and socialization skills. Mostly children learn how to read, write, count, add, subtract, multiply, and divide. Students also learn the rules of English grammar, spelling, and vocabulary. Children also learn basic social studies, or history, science, art, 
and music skills and participate in gym or physical education. In elementary schools, children also learn how to follow directions, share, and work in groups. Students usually stay in one classroom all day with one teacher who stays with them throughout the year. Students may leave the classroom to visit the school library, the school gym, and attend special science, art, and music classes. Students also usually leave the classroom for lunch and recess. For lunch, students sit at tables, separated by grade in a large cafeteria. Recess is usually half an hour when children go into a yard to play. The typical school day starts at about 8 in the morning and ends at about 3 p.m. Students go to school from Monday to Friday and have the weekends off. Elementary school teachers are licensed by the state where they work. They have to graduate from college or even graduate school taking special classes in early childhood and elementary education. Before teachers can be in a classroom with students, they have to pass a background check and take an exam. Once a child finishes fifth or sixth grade in elementary school, they graduate and go on to middle school or junior high school. This school is a separate building or a set of buildings. Most students in middle school are between the ages of 10 and 14. The grade system continues in middle school. Middle school usually starts with sixth or seventh grade and ends with eighth grade. While they are less common, some elementary schools go from kindergarten to eighth grade. Most students are assigned a middle school based on where they live. However, there are charter, private, and specialized public middle schools that have an application process. The purpose of middle school is to provide a transition period between elementary school and high school. Middle school prepares students for high school life. In middle school, students don't stay in one classroom all day with one teacher. Students can change classrooms for different subjects and have different teachers for each subject. In middle school, some students may even be able to choose some of their own classes, called electives. There is a set core of classes that all students have to take. These include English, math, science, and social studies, or history classes. Gym or physical education classes are also required. A common feature of middle school is a homeroom, which is a classroom students visit at a scheduled time once a day or once a week. A homeroom teacher takes attendance and makes announcements of things students need to know. The homeroom also helps students feel like there is one common place and one common teacher they see regularly. This is to help with the transition from elementary school to secondary school. Once a student finishes middle school, they have a graduation ceremony and go to a high school assigned to them or a high school they picked. After middle or junior high school, U.S. students go to high school. Going to school is free in the United States, including high schools. Students do not need to pay tuitions or even textbooks, and lunches are free. Of course, we are talking about public schools. If parents choose to send their kids to private schools, they need to pay very expensive tuitions. High school is the last four years of school that students in the U.S. are required to attend by law. High school students are divided by grades. It begins at 9th grade and finishes with 12th grade. Some high schools, even public high schools, have admission exams or an application process. Public schools admit students based on where they live. In order to successfully complete high school, students have to complete a series of core classes including math, English, science, history, a foreign language, and gym or physical education. Students usually can also choose to take electives or specialized courses in a subject that interests them. Some high schools in the U.S. have exit exams that students are required to pass in addition to completing their course in order to graduate and earn a high school diploma. A law called the No Child Left Behind Act requires high schools that get federal money to make students take a standardized exam every year. A high school diploma is required for students who want to continue on to college and is considered a minimum requirement for any jobs. High school classes are designed to prepare students for college. Some high schools offer specialized skills so that the students can find their work after graduation without going to college. Those are called vocational high schools. In high school, some students have the opportunity to take advanced placement classes. These are college-level classes. If the students pass an exam after taking AP classes, they can get college credit. In high school, students move from class to class throughout the school day. Not every parent looks forward to the day when their child goes off to school. In fact, some parents are not sending their students to school at all. Instead, they are choosing to teach their children at home. This is called homeschooling. Parents, caregivers, 
or private tutors educate children individually at home, or instead send them off to be formally educated in public or private schools. In the U.S., only about 3% of the children are homeschooled. There are many reasons why some parents choose to homeschool. One reason is that some parents do not feel the children are safe in school because of bullying and growing trend of police in school. Other parents want their children's education to be based on their religion or moral beliefs. Yet other parents feel like the education in school is not good enough. Homeschooling is also seen as a choice for families that live in rural areas and families that travel like actors. There are many different ways to homeschool, and homeschooling allows parents to customize lessons based on their children's needs. Families can purchase textbooks to use or create their own materials. Some parents who follow a philosophy called unschooling, which allows a child to determine when and how they want to learn based on their natural curiosity. Some worry that homeschooling means students won't have opportunities to socialize. To answer this concern, some families have created cooperatives, where a group of homeschooled students will learn and play together and participate in activities that would normally happen in school, like field trips and prom. Being homeschooled doesn't mean a student cannot go to college. Most colleges accept homeschooled students. It is important, however, for parents and students to create a portfolio or proof of what has been learned. When parents send their children to school, often they don't know what happens day to day. Parents rely on what their children tell them about what they are doing and what they are learning. Generally, schools will host parent-teacher conferences at least twice a year. Parent-teacher conferences are short meetings between parents and their children's teachers. Usually, parent-teacher conferences are held when teachers give out a student's grades for the term. The parent-teacher conferences give teachers an opportunity to let parents know how their child is doing. A teacher will let a parent know the student's strengths and bring to the parent's attention any problems with grades or behavior. The meetings also offer parents the opportunity to ask questions and see what their child is learning. When it is almost time for parent-teacher conferences, the school will send parents a note and usually give them an appointment time. There are appointments during the day and in the evening. Evening appointments are used for parents who work during the day. Parent-teacher conferences do not last very long. Normally, they do not last longer than 10 minutes. This is why it is important for parents to make sure they arrive at their appointments on time and come prepared with questions. If a parent needs more than 10 minutes, he or she should try to schedule another meeting with a teacher. Keeping a teacher for more than 10 minutes when there are parents waiting is disrespectful. Most children do not go along with their parents in the meetings. This allows both the parent and the teacher to talk honestly about the child's progress without making the child feel bad. Usually, a teacher will offer advice to the parent on how to support their child's education. Public school is available for kids from kindergarten through 12th grade free of charge. However, many families choose to pay for their children's primary and secondary education by sending them to private schools. There are many different types of private schools and many different reasons why parents send their kids there. Some private schools are military type and yet others are boarding schools where students live on campus. Some private schools are affiliated with a certain religion. These schools teach a specific faith beliefs and traditions as well as regular academic subjects. There are schools run by Catholics, Protestants, Jewish people, Muslims, and Orthodox Christians. There are also private schools that specialize in teaching disabled students. Some parents choose private schools because they feel that they offer a better education than public schools. Others choose private schools because they offer a different type of curriculum. Waldorf schools, for example, only let children play and use items made of natural materials. Private schools are also called independent schools or non-state schools because they are not run by local, state, or national governments. They can pick up what students go to their schools. They do this through admission examinations and interviews. There is often an admissions application. Some private schools accept anyone who can pay tuition or money to send their children there. Some schools charge up to $45,000 a year. Private schools charge tuition because they do not get any money collected from local, state, and national taxes. Some private schools offer a limited number of scholarships to help pay for school. Many of these scholarships are need-based, meaning for students who can't afford the tuition. Other scholarships are offered for students with very good grades or for students that have a talent in a sport or art. California is the largest state in the United States of America. 
It is home to more than 10% of the country's total population. It also has the largest education system in the country. The college and university system is divided into four parts. Those parts are the University of California system, the California State University system, the community college system, and private institutions. The UC system has more than 230,000 students at its 10 campuses. It is considered the more prestigious system in the state. It includes top universities like UC Berkeley and the University of California, Los Angeles, UCLA. Both schools rank in the top 25 universities in the country, with Berkeley in the top 10. A degree from the UC system is highly sought and the academic standards are higher than the other systems. They are also more expensive. California State Universities count 23 universities in its systems. It is a diversified system that includes two polytechnic universities and a maritime university. These schools offer vocational and maritime education, but also offer traditional academic programs. The systems enrollment approximately 450,000 students with about 45,000 faculty members. The California Community College system is the largest systems of higher education in the state and the world. It boasts 112 campuses and serves approximately 2.4 million students. It offers transfer degrees, vocational training, and associate's degree programs. California is also home to a large number of privately owned and operated schools. These schools have no ties to the state school system, but some do accept transfer students from community colleges. The most noble and prestigious schools in the state are Stanford University in Palo Alto and the University of Southern California in Los Angeles. Driving in the U.S. can be confusing, not just because of all the rules and laws that drivers must follow, but also because of driving customs. Many people in the U.S. are really dependent on their cars to get to work and school. In fact, most American workers spend an hour driving to work each day. In order to drive in the U.S., you have to go through your local Department of Motor Vehicles first and take a written test to get your learner's permit. If you pass this test, you can practice driving so you can pass a road test and get your license. The Department of Motor Vehicles, or DNV, has free booklets you can go and get to study for your learner's permit. You can also access the information online and even take a practice written exam. To prepare for the road test, you can have a friend teach you to drive or pay to take classes at a driving school. You cannot, however, practice driving by yourself. If you are caught driving with only a learner's permit, you can get into trouble with the law. Once you get your driver's license in one state, you can use it to drive in all the United States. Wherever you drive, you will see signs posted along the road indicating the speed limit. These numbers are not a suggestion. Generally, you can drive faster on a highway than on local streets. Local police use special equipment to detect your speed. If they detect you are speeding or driving over the speed limit, police can stop you and give you a ticket. You will have to pay a fine, and some of the fines are more than $100. The lines painted on the road are not just to keep cars in their lanes. They send a message, for example, a solid double yellow line means that it is against the law to pass another car here. Each New Year's Day, the city of Pasadena in California hosts a celebration to welcome the year with a series of events that includes the Rose Parade. The parade takes place in the center of the city on Colorado Boulevard and features numerous floats, marching bands, equestrian teams, celebrities, and honorees. It is the most popular parade in the country. It has spawned several other New Year's Day parades throughout the country. In Miami, it's the Orange Bowl Parade. In New Orleans, it is the Sugar Bowl Parade. In Arizona, it's called the Fiesta Bowl Parade. However, the Rose Parade is the oldest and best parade. Many people like to camp out in tents or sleeping bags the night before to get the best locations to view the Rose Parade. To brave the cold weather, some people bring portable heaters to keep them warm. It can get into the low 40s at night in Pasadena during the winter, so many people dress warm for the occasion. Food is another big feature at the pre-parade celebration on New Year's Eve. People bring their portable grills to cook their favorite outdoor meals right on the sidewalk. The rich aroma of grilling food fills the night air, and most people are willing to share their food with other overnight campers. It is fun to sample different dishes from other grillers. As night turns into morning, there is still electricity in the air. People are excited about the start of the parade, which begins at 8 a.m. sharp. The floats are beautifully decorated in flowers, while the dancers and other performers dress in colorful costumes, some of which are made just for the parade. The marching band comes from nearby cities, high schools, and colleges. It is considered a great honor to participate in the Rose Parade. The self-portrait is nothing new. Painters and photographers have always used themselves as subjects. Today, however, almost everyone walks around with a camera in his or her pocket. 
This is because most cell phones have cameras on them. The fact that most people have cell phone cameras with them all the time has led to the rise of the selfie. A selfie is a self-portrait usually taken with a cell phone. Since the pictures are usually taken on a cell phone, many people tend to share these photographs with friends and even strangers on different social networking websites. Some of the popular social networking platforms people use to share selfies include Instagram, Snapchat, and Facebook. People usually take selfies when they are engaged in normal day-to-day -day activities. They take selfies of their commutes to work or school. People take selfies of themselves eating. Other people take selfies to show what they are wearing or whom they are hanging out with. The most common way to take a selfie is by holding a cell phone at arm's length. Some people take selfies by taking a picture of their reflection in the mirror. In these pictures, you can usually see the phone of the person is taking a picture with. Selfies taken using a mirror are often taken in a bathroom, which some people think is offensive. The bathroom is a very private place, not a place to take pictures. Some people think that selfies are a sign that people are becoming vain or superficial. It is not often that people take pictures of themselves that make them look bad. When people take pictures of themselves, they usually are trying to present themselves in the best light. However, some people use selfies to show what they really look like. Some people are trying to challenge stereotypes of what makes someone attractive. In U.S. cities like New York and Los Angeles, many people live in small apartments. Despite not having homes with big yards, some apartment dwellers still seek the companionship that domesticated animals like dogs and cats offer. Some people feel that having a pet, even in a small space, is good for teaching children responsibility. However, many landlords forbid tenants from having pets, specifically cats and dogs, because of the damage the animals can do to carpets. Some landlords even forbid birds because of the noise they make. Many landlords charge an extra fee, known as a pet deposit, to tenants who want to keep the pets. This is to pay for repairs or cleaning caused by the pet. Many times, apartment dwellers will choose animals like fish, hermit crabs, guinea pigs, or hamsters that make little noise, little mess, and won't chew up the furniture. Other people keep lizards as pets since they don't require much space and can be kept in small cages or tanks. Another benefit of these smaller pets is that they don't need to be walked. However, some people who live in apartments have pets that are not so ordinary. Some of these less than ordinary pets include mammals like hedgehogs, amphibians like frogs, and spiders like tarantulas. Not all exotic pets are legal though. In order to maintain public safety, some cities and states have laws banning specific animals as pets. New York City, for example, bans people from keeping ferrets, snapping turtles, pythons, and scorpions as pets. It seems unlikely that a family would have a polar bear named Fluffy or a whale named Bubbles as a pet. New York City has specific laws banning these wild animals from residences. These laws exist for a good reason. In 2003, a man in a Manhattan apartment was discovered to have a 350-pound Bengal tiger as a pet. A wake is when people go to a deceased person's home or a funeral parlor to pay their last respects. A funeral parlor is a place where the preparation of the corpse for burial takes place. Part of the preparation can be dressing the deceased, doing their makeup, and placing them in a coffin for people to see. Some people do have a closed casket wake where you can't see the dead person. Some people are not even choosing coffins for their daily departed loved ones. In the United States, more and more families are choosing not to have traditional wakes. There is a recent trend of people having non-traditional wakes with a deceased person posed doing something they love doing when they were alive. For example, a family in New Orleans had their dead loved one pose at a table with a cigarette between her fingers and a can of beer. One funeral home in Puerto Rico has become famous for its non-traditional wakes. It all started in 2008 when a family asked for their dead loved one to be propped up against the wall of their home for the wake. When a paramedic died, his family had his dead body in the driver's seat of an ambulance. Another family had a man propped up in a fake boxing ring for his wake. One dead man was posed on top of his motorcycle. Recently, a grandmother was posed sitting in her rocking chair. These non-traditional wakes have their critics though. Some people think they are disrespectful. They think of a death as a solemn and sad occasion, not a time to pose the dead as if they were toys. Fans feel it helps them remember the dead as they were when they were alive. It is very common to see homeless people on the streets of Los Angeles. This is a problem that has persisted in the city since the beginning of the 20th century. Back in that time, 
California was known for offering many job opportunities in farming, and many young men were hopping on trains from all over the country to arrive in Los Angeles. Unfortunately, many of those men often ended up finding themselves without a job, a place to stay, or even food to eat. To help these people, many churches began to establish shelters in the area of Los Angeles that would eventually become downtown. Even as the farm landscape changed to a big city environment, these shelters remained a refuge for many individuals that found themselves homeless in the area. Nowadays, the homeless population of Los Angeles is made up of much more than just young men looking for work. Many economic and social changes have resulted in both men and women of all ages turning to the streets of Los Angeles. Some of them are there as a result of substance abuse that has left them moneyless and jobless. Others are veterans from various wars that cannot find the resources to get their normal lives. Additionally, many of these people suffer from mental disabilities that limit them from finding a job or being accepted in the rest of society. Since there are a lot of different causes that lead to homelessness, it is easy to see why finding solutions to helping all of the homeless people is so difficult. Although there are many programs that focus on providing the homeless food daily, it is much harder to find programs that try to assist the homeless in finding jobs and stable housing. In order to finally find a solution that will effectively help decrease the number of homeless people in the city, a lot more individualized attention must be placed on individuals based on their physical and mental health and circumstance. Some of the everyday heroes in the United States are the country's paramedics. These young men and women are usually the first people who respond to medical emergencies suffered by citizens. Paramedics must complete a very extensive physical training program that is designed to weed out those who cannot make the cut. A paramedic must be in fit condition and be mentally strong to perform his or her duties. In the face of danger, many of these heroes must end their life-threatening situation when responding to emergencies. Paramedics are usually attached to a county or city fire department but there are also some private paramedic organizations. In Southern California, there are two primary schools for paramedic training. There are UCLA's Daniel Freeman Paramedic Program and the Paramedic Training Institute. Both of these schools provide candidates for the Los Angeles County and City Fire Departments. To become a paramedic for a county or city organization, candidates must also pass a psychological screening and a physical training program. Some of the equipment paramedics carry is very specialized, they carry basic and advanced life support gear, such as forcible entry tools so they can reach people in peril, saws to cut through obstacles, and other emergency equipment. Paramedics provide a valuable service to the communities they serve. They must be certified in the cardiopulmonary resuscitation techniques, or CPR, and be trained to handle all situations. Some paramedics are trained to respond to what is called mass casualty incidents. These emergencies occur when there is a tragic event such as September 11, 2001 attacks on the country and other emergencies like earthquakes, mudslides, or floods. Paramedics can also be sent to emergency situations by citizens who call the 911 emergency phone number. One of the darkest days in American history was September 11, 2001. This is a day that will live in infamy for most Americans. It was the most tragic day in the history of the country since December 7, 1941, when the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor. September 11th was the day Muslim extremists hijacked four commercial airliners in an attempt to destroy the American spirit by slamming those jets into four buildings. Three of the four jets reached their targets, while one was stopped by a group of everyday heroes who gave their lives for their country. In the early morning hours on 9-11, American Airlines Flight 11 slammed into the North Tower of the World Trade Center in New York City. A few minutes later, Flight 175, also an American Airlines flight, struck the South Tower. Both suicide attacks brought the towers down, but not immediately. It took time for the extreme heat from the burning jet fuel to weaken the towers to their eventual collapse. At about the same time, American Airlines Flight 77 crashed into the Pentagon which is a government building in the country's capital, Washington, D.C. The fourth flight, United Airlines Flight 93, was also headed for the capital city. Most people think its target was either the Capitol building or the White House, the president's home. A group of brave passengers, upon hearing the news of what has happened in the country, decided to take down the giant airplane even though they knew they would not survive. They stormed the cockpit and took the controls from the hijackers. The plane flew out of control, crashing into a field in the state of Pennsylvania, where all passengers were killed. 
In all, more than 3,000 Americans lost their lives on that day, but the American spirit was not suppressed. Those responsible for the attacks were quickly dealt with, and the country soon began its journey to recovery. September 11, 2001, a day America will never forget.